Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. That was Cass. That was amazing watching John do that. Yeah. You know, it was a great interview, great history. So again, I'm Wake Speed Jr. This is Cass Choate. And Joe, I want to correct you. Everybody's saying I'm the oil guy. But let's this, you know, I'm the hydrocarbon guy. Because <laughs> yes, diesels are hydrocarbons too. So let's give them some love. So Cass, you're the diesel guy. So let's talk about that a little bit. Because I can tell, you know, everybody that in my neighborhood, and of course I'm a racer, I'm, you know, growing up in NASCAR and I still race go-karts, but there's more diesel trucks, performance diesel trucks in my own neighborhood mm -hmm. than there are hot rods. So tells me something about the market you're in. Yeah, absolutely. The, the nice thing about a diesel truck is, uh, you know, guys can go out and put a tuner on a truck and uh, you know, automatically keep up with some of the uh, production cars today, uh, that uh, performance production cars today. It's completely and totally changed uh, over the course of the last 15 years, 20 years. So what used to be considered slow, what used to be considered maybe a, uh, a very lack and throttle response, that's completely changed with technology today. So that's something that's uh, came a tremendous amount of ways in a short period of time. So the question is, I have a 240D Mercedes, 1983 240D Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Can you help me out, make that thing go a little faster? Sure, always park at <laughs> Nose Hill Down. Okay, fair enough, all right, <laughs> you know. So anyway, you know, I mean, in all seriousness, I know you work with Keith at our place. Uh, talk for a little bit about the gapless second ring for a diesel application. Well, today, you know, you and I have discussed this uh, this week. Some of the biggest issues that we're running into is fuel dilution in the oil, and that's because of a lot of the emission systems that the trucks are plagued with today that they right. weren't plagued with, you know, years gone by. So the gapless uh, second ring has really done a great job in uh, allowing for uh, basically that barrier to be, be placed in between. It's a better seal. It's a better seal. Exactly. Well, again, you said we, we know that in diesel, I mean, a lot of people may not realize this, that in diesel engines, it's actually soot that generates most of the wear. I mean, Cummins, uh, Cat, they actually have standardized tests that are soot wear tests. So controlling that soot, having that better seal so the soot can't blow by and get into the oil makes a big difference in terms of the longevity and the health of that engine. So talk a little bit about fuel dilution. Now, that's one of the things we were mentioning earlier. That, that's probably one of the things that's really changed the diesel market the most is the multi-squirt, for lack of a better term, injector. Yeah, multi-squirt injection is a huge change because uh, the, uh, some of the tolerances uh, of the diesel industry were, you know, you've got to noise Summarize what you just said. said there's, there's a, a lot, lot of tech in diesel, diesel today. today. Oh, yeah. you know, that, look at my old 240D Mercedes. It's pretty mechanical. And now we're talking about diesels that are pretty high tech. I know I got to, I had the fortune, me and my dad, we were going up to Newcastle, Indiana for a go kart race. And I met one of the guys, Roger England, who uh, was at Cummins, who was a research engineer. And he invited me and my dad to come up and spend a day going through Cummins R&D plant in Columbus, we were both blown away by the level of technology, the testing, the detail, the science of a diesel engine. And it was you know, mind altering to me because I'm like, wow, this, you think dirty old diesel, loud, not powerful, uh, 
was he said that day, that's not your father's own automobile? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, pre-combustion chambers, you know, the days of 20 to 2 to 1 compression ratios versus now the new uh, Duramax that came out in the 1500 uh, is running a 15 to 1 compression ratio. Are you kidding me? It, it has changed. Didn't that so lower spread? compression than a sprint car engine these days. But yeah, lower <laughs> compression and the reason why we're able to do that again goes to combustion bolt design in the piston, mm -hmm. but also in the multi-point injection. So that uh, that's radically changed things. Uh, the diesel industry years ago, you know, it was just your Dodge Ram, well, going back, your Oldsmobile 350 Chevrolet with the spark plugs pulled out and injectors <laughs> put in kind of thing. But now, you know, from there, it was the 12 valve Cummins to today. Now we're looking at, you know, the new L5Ps and the 6.7 Power Stroke and Cummins that uh, have really, you guys are racing them on the weekends mm -hmm. and then going to work on Monday through Friday on them. So, I mean, it's, it's the ultimate play toy, you know. That's awesome. So, I think we have the video of you getting deeper into all this queued up. So let's go ahead and watch that video. Hi guys, welcome to the shop. I'm Cass Choate, owner of Choate Engineering Performance. We are a diesel manufacturer. We are a problem solver. We are very involved with the diesel industry and through Ford, Chevrolet, Dodge is, is pretty much our mainstay. What we focus on is fixing problems, not just manufacturing engine that's gonna last, that's gonna meet your needs daily, driving up down the road, pulling the loads, going to the horse shows, uh, being a hot shotter, whether you're pulling a 40 foot flatbed uh, behind you everywhere you go. Uh, but what we do is we focus on the OEM problems and we figure out how to do aftermarket solutions so that uh, you keep more money in your pocket and you are able to drive down the road uh, with uh, worry-free uh, traveling. So today I just kind of wanted to welcome you in the shop and show you what we've got going on. Uh, it's not enough, as you well know, engines today, the diesel engines are up against it. They have uh, more emissions and they have uh, more horsepower output than ever before. So our mainstay is again fixing the uh, OEM problems with aftermarket solutions. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history about our company, I started out uh, many years ago as a, just a diesel tech and seeing the problems come in every day, it was just me and my wife, and seeing the, the problems with the, uh, the trucks that would come in each day, I wished that there were some solution to some of the problems, just fixing the truck back to the OEM standards and sending them back down the road. Uh, it wasn't truly a, a uh, permanent fix. It was, a, it was a solution, but it was only a temporary solution to a permanent problem. So it started out with just me and my wife, and we uh, obviously uh, were in the repair side of things, and uh, we were looking for, when a customer would bring in a truck, uh, we wanted a permanent solution instead of a temporary solution to a permanent problem. Uh, so we started looking as people were bringing uh, vehicles to us. I'm very much a hands-on type person. I don't like to outsource anything. Our shop's representative of that. If you look around, there's nothing that we outsource. Everything's done 100% entirely in-house from whether it's crank grinding to balancing to engine machining, doesn't matter, it's done in-house. We would have customers come in and they would need their engines rebuilt. And I, were, I was using uh, local machine shops for my work and I just could not get the quality product, the quality work, that the standard that I hold myself to, I couldn't get it from some of the machine shops. And a lot of the machine shops that we would find that have been in business for many, many years, uh, they really do not want to invest in the technology that's out there anymore. Um, a lot of the guys that are retired or fixing to retire, they're just not willing to make that investment, which it is, it is a substantial investment. But it's one that I, I believe that is, uh, as far as product-wise and being able to put out a quality product, uh, I think it's imperative. We fought that struggle with uh, different machine shops. And finally, I decided after a catastrophic failure uh, by some sleeves that were installed by a local shop that we're completely, I sat down on the shop floor, true story, and I said after starting the engine up uh, and it ran for about 15 seconds, uh, it, the um, truck started up, sounded like it had low compression, and it sucked a sleeve into the crankshaft, ex exploded the block, destroyed it. And uh, this was a truck that we had to get out. It had to be done. The customer needed the truck. I actually had a funeral the, the following day. I was going to Missouri. We were closing on a house. It was just the epitome of, of a terrible week. So we decided uh, right then and there is about 11 o'clock at night. 
I sat down on the floor and I said, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm getting completely out of this business of engine building or I'm gonna completely get in it 100%. And as you can see, we decided for the latter. What we've done is we've uh, had a great team to work with with Brotler. They've been exceptional people to, to, to back us and we're really excited to have them in our corner. But they put out a, a fantastic product which allows us to do our job. So we invested heavily in the greatest, uh, latest and greatest technology that we could for engine machining. CNC honing, CNC blueprint boring, uh, surfacing, all the F69 that we have which is the machine that you see behind me. We've got a five axis porting machine that allows us to digitize and to uh, write tool pass and, and to port uh, for any type of cylinder heads that we might have a need for, seat and guide work, all of these things and, and we're able to cover this and, and do a wonderful job with uh, the help of, of Rottler. Going from the repair standpoint, which is Diesel Doctor, and it's the company that we still own, uh, we have trucks that are shipped uh, from the entire country, uh, all over the United States to us, where we'll take the truck, completely rebuild the engine, fix the OEM problems, um, and then we'll have a customer, they'll actually fly in and pick the truck up and, and, and drive it home. But we didn't stop there. Again, we, we're trying to uh, make this kind of the one-stop shop, and we do so much that we try to uh, be our biggest customer, right? So there's so many things that we find that we have a need for, whether it's parts, whether it's aftermarket solutions, whether it's machining, whether it's re reverse engineering. Um, those are all things that we have a need for. And because our need is so great, it's caused us to invest into those areas. We're actually, the, the current facility that you see us in, we're uh, looking to move after the first of the year into a facility that's actually 10 times the size of this one. And uh, we're gonna be expanding for everything from uh, diesel part sales uh, to uh, reverse engineering what we're working on now. We have 3D scanning capabilities now so that if a customer actually sent us a part and they said, okay, this is what we want, but we want to modify it. We don't want it like the OE's got it. Uh, we want it to be, it, it may be fit and, and line up this way with an OE application, but we want it to completely f function differently. We're able to do that, reverse engineer it and actually machine the part for you. So there's no real reason to go outside and find you know, a machine shop that will do this for part manufacturing, not just, we don't just do engine manufacturing, but part manufacturing, but also uh, to take your project from start to finish with a completed, uh, with a completed project that we can ship to you. Uh, something that, again, not to rehash too much on this, but something that we really do focus on is uh, a slogan that, that Chrysler used years ago, and I loved it when I heard it, and I thought, man, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but they, they said that their cars were designed and it was fashion by function. And I think that's extremely important. We make a lot of different products here. Uh, one of the products that we actually make that I'm uh, excited about is some of the uh, billet valve covers that we, that we make. Uh, the purpose of the billet valve cover is not just for the, the uh, fashion, but the function side. We've seen a tremendous amount of failures with the rocker arms for this particular engine where the oiling system was pretty much omitted through the design change from the predecessor engine, which would be the 6.0. So what we did was we took a beautiful valve cover that is a, a, a kind of a crown jewel piece for the engine, but then we mounted an oiling system underneath it. So it's fashioned by function. So there is a purpose for everything that we do. Um, I, I'm a guy that I love horsepower. I, I love a car, a, a beautiful car, but at the end of the day, the ugliest car in the world is the one that doesn't run. And we want uh, to make these products so that not only are they, they uh, nice to look at and appealing, but they actually have, serve a, a very vital purpose. So these are things that we focus on um, and we'll, we're excited to show you some of those products. So behind me is uh, just another example of what we do here at Chode Engineering Performance. So we've got uh, on this Rottler F69 ATC, loaded up as a, uh, a piece of 4340 uh, billet that we are going to be machining some main caps for Duramax diesel. Now the Duramax is plagued with the crankshaft issues, the failures of crankshaft, and we know that uh, through the cast cap there's a, there tends to be a lot of fretting. Everybody likes horsepower and nobody likes to tune more than the diesel world. Uh, every, every diesel owner uh, seems like, I would say 80% diesel owners, they've got some type of tuning device on their truck. Everybody loves the torque that they provide, the horsepower, the fuel mileage, the fuel economy, obviously, and the longevity that it provides. So we look again at those problems that are uh, from certain platforms. The Duramax de definitely 
uh, is a fantastic platform, but there's one area of weakness in it, and the main caps, uh, the fretting from the main caps from additional horsepower that's added can lead to crankshaft uh, fatigue and failure at sometimes. So what we've done is we've designed some billet main caps for the Duramax diesel. Now, this is all the way from 2001 all the way up to present day. So let me show you what we've got going on here. Again, the reason why we invested so much in the equipment that we have is because of what it allows us to do. I'd like to show you a, a few of the very unique functions that Rottler has in their uh, wheelhouse, and it makes, it makes our job so much easier. So let me show you those now. Behind me you'll see uh, a program, a software that we've got pulled up, and it's called Fusion 360. Now this software is uh, by Autodesk, and it has really came to fruition in the last few years. It's fantastic because it does two things. It allows me to do CAD and CAM. Now for the guys that don't know what that is, CAD is what's known as computer-aided design, okay? So what that means is, is before I can actually make that part, I've got to make a model so I know what the end representation of what it's going to look like, right? So you can see on the screen here, here's a billet main cap, okay? So we've taken this through the CAD side of the software, which we can click over here and go into design, and you can see that through this timeline where it starts, and I'm just going to play through this so that you can actually see me build this uh, this uh, main cap right here. And this is how we modeled this up. And once this is modeled, we can take and we can finish, we're done. Now that we've got this modeled up, we're gonna go ahead and move over to the manufacturing side. Now this is the CAM side. Now what CAM stands for is uh, Computer Aided Manufacturing. We have to be able to draw some type of tool path and able to achieve the end goal, which is to make the part. But there's a lot of things, in days gone by, people would use what is known as G-code. It's cumbersome. For those that aren't familiar with it, it, uh, it can be hard to learn. The Rottler Block software uh, makes it extremely easy for guys that aren't necessarily engine, that are engine machinists, but not what we would consider a G-coder. Uh, it makes it very simple for them to be able to uh, start to finish, uh, instantly kind of jump in there, because it's what we know is conversational programming. It asks you something. What would you like to do? How would you like to do it? you know, from this point to this point, and it walks you through in a very conversational type manner. The CAD CAM software with Fusion 360 allows us to do more dynamic milling, meaning it's not so straightforward of type machining where we're moving in a linear fashion uh, in, in a, a direct motion, but sometimes we'll have what's known as may, maybe torcoidal machining, which is where there's rapid movement uh, within the, the machine to move as much material as we can as quickly as we can to get it off the, the, uh, the part. So instead of trying to draw all that out, it would be an absolute nightmare. You'd have thousands and thousands of lines of code, but we can do this through this CAD CAM package. Now what really makes this unique to Rottler is the fact that you see me, I'm sitting at this machine. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to have a laptop that sits in my office or bring it out to this, the nasty shop and go in and try to do all this modeling and everything that you see and then load it to the machine with a thumb drive and then from there have to upload everything. I can actually make changes completely at the machine. If I decide that that bolt hole isn't exactly where I want it or that model is, is not quite the way that I had intended it, I can do the modeling here and then I can transfer it over to the cam and just as easy as that, I can open up the RCAM software and import it and now you see the tool path through the RCAM software right here which is really neat because you can see the end mill and that's actually uh, where the end mill is now, right now on the table, which makes it really nice to see how that's gonna play out for me. If my clearances are where they should be, if there's gonna be any type of crashes or anything like that, I can already see that before it ever happens. So that's something that's very unique to Rottler. We've got other machines in the shop that don't have this capability. It's just a controller, but it's not a conversational controller and it's not uh, a one and all type setup. There's nothing more valuable than your time. You can obviously make more money, but you'll never make more time. So being able to have things that are, uh, allow us to save, uh, that are time savers, save our lives, if you think of it that way. Going back and forth and having to retransition is something else that you're not gonna uh, only see here. We'll show the same thing with the, the Rottler porting uh, software. Having it all in one and at the controller, at the machine means that if there's a problem, everything, my whole office is now consolidated to this machine. Where I sit right now, and the computer that I use right now, this is my entire office. There's nothing outside of this, uh, this 
footprint that I need. So it saves us a tremendous amount of time from transitioning, from uh, moving a file from one computer to another computer, but to have this all at the machine that we are operating is a tremendous amount of time savings, which means more profitability for the end user. So you've got a CNC machine and uh, you've had it for a while or maybe you just made that purchase, but you really don't want to delve off into the CAD CAM side and learning how to program. It's uh, too much and it's a little scary. It's no problem. You don't have to quit there. You don't have to call it quits. Give us a call. We can help you. What we do is allow you to send us your projects, whether uh, physically, mail them to us, or you can email them uh, if you have a file or anything of that sort. And we can write the programs for you so that all you'll have to do is load the tools, load, load the material, uh, and load the file that we send you, and you'll be able to manufacture the part on your machine, in your shop, at your leisure. That's another service that we provide to our customers, uh, programming so that they can make sure that they're making the most out of their equipment. Welcome back guys, uh, we're back at the F69 ATC Rottler machine and now we want to talk a little bit about what makes us different with block machining. Just as it is when you're building a house you want a great foundation because anything that you do after that it really doesn't matter until you have a good solid foundation. Anything else would be to no avail and that's no different than you would expect with engine machining. So how we ensure that we have a, a good foundation is to start with the main center lines and we've already taken this block and we have uh, straightened the, uh, the main journals and made sure that they are uh, they're concentric. So we're moving along now. We've got the block loaded in the machine. So what we wanna make sure is a lot of uh, the older machine shops, you've heard me talk about before, some of the struggles that I had as a, uh, as a mechanic coming in. Uh, a lot of the machines just didn't have enough X travel uh, to be able to, to deck the surfaces of some of these longer blocks, especially things like the Cummins blocks. With this F69, that's no problem whatsoever. There's enough travel there and we can go ahead and deck the surface. It's extremely critical, as you know, what we're doing right now is ensuring that the failure rate, especially of the predecessor engines we were talking about, some of the power stroke stuff, where the deck surfaces were critical because of the blown head gaskets being four bolts uh, on the, uh, the head bolts, uh, it was extremely critical that we have two flat surfaces. So without good surface prep, there is absolutely uh, not gonna be a good end result for this. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna bore the block and then we're gonna deck the surface. One thing though that we love about the F69 from Rottler is that the probing ability allows us not only to find the center of a location or to use a certain datum in order to blueprint bore and that term is, is often thrown around but basically what we're trying to do is do what the factory either didn't do uh, correctly uh, originally or because of the block distortion now we can actually do what we consider reconstructive surgery where we're going back through and we're fixing uh, the locations of things as a cast iron block settles over through uh, heat cycles and things like that sometimes those bores shift and they're not where they should be so we're able to fix this years ago you know the older equipment would have just a, a type of centering uh, system that would allow for three fingers maybe to come out and they would center over the existing bore. The problem with that is is you kind of have to take what you get. We don't have to settle because now with the uh, ability for uh, probing we can do this quickly um, instead of having to take uh, a much longer time to be able to measure a certain datum and then move in a, uh, a manual uh, manner and record all these numbers we can do it at a rapid pace which makes it much easier for us to do this job more efficiently, more cost effective, and to give, again, you a better end result. So what we're gonna do now 
is we're going to actually measure the bore to ensure that they're over the center line of the crankshaft, okay? So we want to make sure that if there is any distortion in that bore, whether it was done at the factory, we're able to, to ensure that uh, we get the block back to uh, its, uh, its correct location. That ensures a lot less thrust wear that we see on the block. If the block, if the, uh, uh, the bore has shifted, then we tend to be a little bit closer with that piston on one side or the other, and it aggravates uh, that, that very scenario. It makes it worse and it creates more thrust wear on the block. The next thing that we'll do after we do this is make sure that we can square deck the block. Basically what that does is ensures the top of the deck to the center line of the crankshaft uh, of the main journal. Um, it, it ensures that there is a uh, there is equality between the left and the right bank. This is critical for compression ratios. Uh, otherwise, everything is inconsistent. And we know, if anything, with engine machining, there's one thing that we have to make sure that we do, and that's consistency. All right, so the next thing we're gonna show you is we've got our probe values here on the left location and also the right location of the bank. Now, something that you're not gonna find on your conventional boring bar is this, obviously, this blueprint page. You wouldn't find it on anything. Uh, of course, with the, uh, with the interface that we have with this, it makes it very handy. But with the probe numbers, it tells us what we've actually got. With the blueprint numbers, we can manipulate this and, and put where we actually want the bores. So we can, uh, like I say, find a datum that we know is correct, whether that be a, um, a cylinder uh, dowel on the, uh, the deck surface and locate off of that to ensure that all the bores are spaced correctly. So right now, we've taken these probe numbers, we can copy those values over into the blueprint numbers and then manipulate those to get the desired result. Okay, so now that we finished with the F69, we've got the block board, we've got it square decked, we've got the center line right where we want it. What we wanna do now is finish the cylinder walls to the size for the pistons. So it's extremely critical, this next process. What this is gonna entail is making sure the cross hatch angles, the surface finishes, all the things that are absolutely necessary for longevity of the engine are definitely gonna happen in this operation. So. Uh, many shops uh, used to have uh, older equipment and some still do have the older equipment. Here at Chode Engineering Performance, we want to make sure that we made the best investment possible. Uh, for a, a critical part of engine machining, such as honing, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had the best in technology. Now, we prefer Rottler, and that's the reason why we chose them, because of the technology that goes behind the equipment. It allows us to create a much, much better uh, end result and thus a much better product for our customers. So with that said, we chose the Rottler H85AX, and this uh, machine allows us to do some things that the other ones didn't. What I love about this, this particular machine is that uh, it has an awesome interface here that gives us a lot of uh, versatility. So what we're able to do is dial in where used to, the old way of doing things, you might have to do by hand. What we can do now is put in the desired results uh, and get, get just the, the outcome that we're looking for and uh, that's seen here on the display. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start this now. <clears throat> and as you can see it lower and behind me, what this will depict is actually the health of the cylinder wall. So this is gonna allow us to see what's actually going on in the bore in real time as it's honing. Here you can actually see the hone going down and doing crash detection. This is really something that's, that's great when you get into blocks that might have main saddles that could be a problem. So as you can see, the Rottler hone going up, inside, going up and down in the cylinder bore itself right now, you'll also be able to see this, this line right here. Now what that does is that gives us a representation of what the cylinder wall actually looks like in a profile view. You can see the 20, 40, 60, and so on percentage. What that is is the tightness of the bore. If we've got a tight spot, you can see that with the red line indicated there. Now, the software in this, uh, this hone is smart enough to realize through amperage load the areas that need to be addressed more or honed out because of taper. Now, what it'll do is, whether it's a short stroke or a dwell, it'll do that completely automatically for us so that we don't have to do that by hand. What that does is gives us a consistent result every time. We don't have one day where 
the guy felt better, the operator felt better today than he does the, the next day, or his mind might not necessarily be there. We can leave this up completely to the CNC equipment that we have so that we have a consistent result every engine, every time, and we have the proper clearances for the piston. But not only that, as you can see the load that's going up and down, what we also have here is as we go through the setup, it gives us a complete list of all the things that you would ever want uh, in the way of, of honing a cylinder wall. Now the two things that we're looking for is cylindricity and concentricity. Cylindricity would be the consistency from the beginning plane to the end plane, where concentricity might be the consistency of the radius of the arc to the center of its circle. So basically what we're after is true and round of hold as we can possibly get. So what this page allows us to do is it allows us to adjust all the parameters that you'd ever want when actually uh, honing a cylinder wall. So we're two, looking for two basic things, cylindricity and concentricity. Cylindricity is much like a slinky. So from the beginning plane to the end plane, the consistency over that linear path is what you're looking for in cylindricity. Whereas concentricity might be the consistency of the arc around the center point of the circle itself or the radius of that arc. So what we're looking for is the round, the, the true and round hole as we can possibly achieve will aid and help us in creating a better uh, seal for the piston ring. And power and fuel economy, longevity, these are all things that are completely and totally dependent on that seal. In the diesel application, it's extremely critical because that seal is where we see a lot of combustion gases leak past. So a lot of guys ask us, how often should I change my oil? Well, one thing is, is the better the prep for the cylinder wall, the better the sealing ring. What you don't see as much of is the wash and the combustion gases entering into the, to the crankcase which will dilute the oil and cause lower bearing failure or it can be it can compromise the lower bearing area so what we want to do is achieve the best seal possible and this allows us to do that so also on this screen we can set up what we see as cross hatch angle here it allows us to punch in a desired angle now what that angle does is it basically allows us to dictate the length or duration the oil will actually stay on the wall it allows us to control the actual rotation of the ring. The steeper the, the crosshatch angle, the more rotation that we see from the ring. These things are extremely crucial when you're talking about oil consumption as well. Too flat of an area or crosshatch angle can lead to uh, more oil consumption, whereas too steep a crosshatch angle sometimes can lead to premature cylinder wear or premature ring wear. So it's extremely crucial that we're able to dictate this and hit that consistent number every single time. And Rottler allows us to do that. Being that the uh, purchase and the choice of a uh, home was so critical, we tried to weigh all the factors in that we could when making this selection because it is extremely, like we said, a vital and critical part of engine, engine machining and engine building. So one of the main factors that we were looking at uh, also is we wanted a vertical hone. The purpose of the vertical hone is so that actually all the motion is more of an axial motion instead of a rocker style motion. Now you can see this and this is a good representation or a good, uh, good example if you look at maybe a valve bridge uh, or the top of a valve stem on, on, a, uh, on a cylinder head. You see that the, uh, the wear is across the valve stem or across the, the valve bridge itself. And this is because of that rocker motion actually pushing out as it, uh, as it comes down. Much like the same way with the cylinders uh, that we see some of that banana shaping. So for this reason, we chose a vertical hone. Now there's also another added benefit to the vertical hone. Because of the uh, deceleration and acceleration uh, as the, the hone head starts and stops at the top and the bottom of the bore, you don't get the same crosshatch angle uh, between the middle of the cylinder and the top of the cylinder as you would with a vertical hone because of this reason. Much like the way that the piston would stop at the top of its bore and reverse direction, it's the same way as it does with the cylinder head hone. Now along with that, something else that we wanted to, to uh, make sure that we, uh, we made an investment in was the roundness we've talked about, roundness and straightness of the cylinder walls themselves. Now one way that it, it's extremely critical to achieve a true round hole is by the, the amount of stones that are actually used on the hone head. Now as you can imagine, the more stones actually allows for a rounder hole. And the reason for this is because the contact area is greater on the cylinder wall. So you might think of this kind of like a bed of nails. Of course we've all seen the trick where the guy lays on the bed of nails, somebody walks across him and he's not impaled. 
He doesn't die, he lives, right? So we can kind of use that as an example for uh, what we're looking for in the cylinder wall and the stones. Basically, that's a good representation of what happens. The more contact area, it's spread over uh, more surface area and it allows for that stone to make contact in more areas. It centers in the wall and it allows for much more round hole. Um, we see a huge difference between a four stone to a six stone and as we go up in stones and we add more stones, we get more round hole. Uh, this is the reason why we've chosen a uh, six stone uh, hone head for ours here at Chode Engineering Performance. The next thing that we were looking for, again we've talked about consistency between the different engines that we do. Now we do all types of engines here but the mainstay is definitely the power stroke that comes in the Duramax for us because we're obviously known for the diesel market. Now one thing that's a little unique about uh, Duramaxes are that they use what's called induction hardening in the top of the cylinder walls. Now anybody that's ever pulled a cylinder head off of a Duramax engine has instantly noticed there's a shading area. There's actually five layers of shading uh, on the top of that cylinder wall. Now that changes the uh, hardness of the cylinder wall drastically so that the cylinder wall in the middle, the lower, is completely different in its hardness than that of the top of the cylinder wall. Now, the reason for this is because of thrust wear. The greatest amount of wear on the cylinder occurs at the top of the cylinder when the pistons actually change in directions and combustion takes place. It actually digs into the cylinder wall. So with the Duramax especially, it's, it's very critical that uh, for a round hole uh, over the roundness and the straightness of that, that we're able to uh, program the top and the bottom overstroke. So as that hone head comes and changes directions, obviously it's going to dwell more in those areas. Now it's very problematic for some manufacturers of cylinder hones to be able to achieve this because the top is harder than the bottom itself, so we need to overstroke more at the top than actually we do at the bottom. So it's very hard for a lot of manufacturers to achieve this. With Rottler it's no problem. Now it's extremely critical that we're able to program a different overstroke at the top of the cylinder than at the bottom of the cylinder because of the hardness at the top of the cylinder through induction hardening. Now with Rottler it's very easy because we can go to our setups page here and it basically just asks us what do we want for the, the upper overstroke versus the lower overstroke. Now every cylinder is a little different, every engine is a little different. Once you dial that in and it's programmed, it's saved, and you can repeat this each time. If we weren't able to do this, what we would end up with is a tighter area or a tighter uh, cylinder at the top of the hole, at the top of the cylinder itself versus the bottom. And then what you would have is the, the contraction of the rings each time it's stroked. So this is no issue here. We can program whatever engines that we're running on. After we've dialed that in, we save our data. And then next time when we come through to do the same block, we can make that repeatable over and over and over again. It makes it extremely easy for the, the operator because the, whether you're having uh, one operator today or a different operator tomorrow, the program saved, we can go to it and we can have the same outcome over and over. Another feature that I love about the Rottler hone is the efficiency of it. While we're honing a block, we can be surfacing a cylinder head on our F69, or we can be running the seat and guide machine, or the guy can be doing any other task in the shop. Let me show you that with this page here. At bore locations, what we can basically do is just go in and center off in our setups page and zero off our X and Z axis. So once that's done and we programmed what our bore locations are, in this case, on this engine, is four inch 565 thousandths. All we'll have to do after we've put in our desired results in the setups page, we'll just go to the operation page, hit cycle start, and it moves to the first location of the hole. It'll feed down and also has crash detection. Now crash detection is a wonderful feature because some blocks may wind up, if it's the first time that you program this block and you, your operator didn't catch it, they may not see that it would hit somewhere in contact in the bottom of the bore. So as it's feeding down right now, what it's looking for is any areas of any obstructions. If it sees this, it'll come out of the bore, retract the stones, and then alerts the operator. Now something else that we do here at Chode Engineering Performance is, again, keeping with the same concept of a straight round hole, what we want to do is make sure that it's not just straight and round in a static position. So what we're looking for is a dynamic position when everything's done, when it's, this engine is in the uh, truck and it's running up and down the road, we need to try to simulate as close as possible what that's going to be like here at the home. Now, for that reason, we have what is known as a torque plate that we manufacture here on our F69 ATC for each individual engine that we uh, are going to home. So what we're allowed to do with that is actually torque this plate down and simulate the actual load that is distressed on the cylinder walls by the cylinder head itself. 
Now there's a couple of things that we do uh, about to make sure that we can make this as accurate a portrayal as what the engine or the, the block would see with a cylinder head is at first we'll, uh, we'll install a cylinder head, torque at the spec, and then once it's torqued, roll the block over, measure the bore dis distortion, and record those numbers. Once those numbers are recorded, we will try to simulate this using the deck plate. If you'll notice, most cylinder heads obviously don't look like a torque plate. They don't have holes in them. There's areas that have water jackets, and they're unique, they're different. The structure of the head's different, so that your structural integrity will affect the bore distortion because of the clamping load that's placed by the head studs or head bolts. So what we like to do is get those numbers, record that data, and then duplicate that as close as possible with the torque plate itself. Once we've installed the torque plate, we'll roll the block over again, we'll measure the bore, we'll look at the numbers that were recorded, and then we'll tweak the, the head studs to whatever it needs to be to simulate the same condition that you would see in a fully operating engine. So that's just one more effort, that's just one more step that we take uh, to make sure that we are able to produce a quality product for our customers. So we've talked about straightness of the cylinder wall, we've talked about the roundness of the cylinder wall, we've talked about the distortion effects of the head studs and bolting the head onto the engine or the engine block. The next thing that we want to talk about is extremely critical. Unfortunately, it's overlooked by many shops today, and that is the use of a profilometer. Now, what the heck's a profilometer? Now, if you call up your local machine shop and you ask them, when you have your cylinders honed, do you use a profilometer? And they say, what's a profilometer? Don't walk away, run. It's extremely critical because this is what's going to affect the longevity of the engine. Without the correct surface finish, the ring life will be substantially decreased, the performance of the engine, and the power of the engine. The use of a profilometer is extremely important because this is the only true way that we can know actually what the health of the cylinder wall is. Not just the health of the cylinder wall, but how it's going to help the rings live. Now just like a water skier that you might see on the lake, there's a hydrodynamic wedge that actually supports the rings against the wall. Just like that skier never actually sinks in the water, he's skiing across that hydrodynamic wedge, the same thing happens with the rings. It's extremely important because if you have metal-to-metal -metal contact, of course we know that creates wear. So what are those things that we're looking for out of a profilometer and why do we use it? A profilometer is basically a gauge that measures the surface finish, but it measures it to a very finite way of measuring so that we can look in, in a tremendous amount of depth uh, what that cylinder wall actually looks like. So to kind of give you an example of what we're looking at, there's three major things that we're looking at. There's many different measurements on a profilometer, but three of the things that we were looking for are what's known as RPK, RVK, and RK. Now what does that mean? Well, if you take something like a bolt, you can actually look at that, and if you're familiar with what a major diameter, a minor diameter, and what the pitch diameter is, it might make sense. So the thread that's the, the furthest out of the crest would be what's considered your major diameter. And the internal part would be considered the minor diameter. And if you were to divide the two and draw a line through the middle of that, that would be what would be considered your pitch diameter. Now this is what's also considered as your RK. Your RPK is what, it's easy to remember because PK, it's a peak, right? So that tells us the height of any fragmentations on the cylinder wall. The RVK, RV staying for the valley. So this is the depth of what the cylinder wall will actually reach. And the RK, again, like we said, it's just like that pitch diameter on the bolt. It's the distance in between the two. So what does this actually mean and why do we need to know about it? This is extremely important because in the cylinder wall there's a difference in application and the environment in which it has to live. With the improper RVK, not enough oil will be maintained on the cylinder wall itself. If this happens because of high turbocharger pressures, high cylinder pressures, higher boost pressures, we're gonna see more and more RVK. So we need more depth, we need more area for that oil to re reside as it stays on the cylinder wall. With this higher boost pressures, we see all that actually trying to blow that oil off the cylinder wall. It's extremely critical that we're able to measure this because the application for a high performance engine certainly doesn't meet the same standards as the application for maybe a daily driver or just a weekend warrior. So the RPK is also something that's extremely critical. Now, to give you an example, years ago we used to machine shop. 
we built several engines using this machine shop. The guy tells you he's been doing it for years and years and years. But let me tell you this, you can do something for many years and still do it wrong. If you don't have a way to measure, you have to guess and not know. This doesn't make for a good end result and it certainly doesn't make for a good product. Because of this, the cylinder wall was too coarse and it wound up wearing the rings out in a rapid succession. So this is something that takes place and can create a tremendous amount of problems for the customer. Certainly it did for us. So we wanted to make sure we didn't fall into that same trap again. So going back now armed with the education that we have now, we made the choice in the equipment that we have. We can ensure that the RPK is where it needs to be because if the RPK is too coarse, it will definitely wear the cylinder rings out uh, rapidly. Now, how do we achieve this? We've talked about the importance of it, but now let's talk about the process of it, the appropriation of it. So in order to do this, we do a multi-stage hone, okay? Multi-stage honing basically means that you're going to use a different stone, a different grit, uh, a coarseness, to go in and actually entrench some of that RVK into the cylinder wall. Because the same stone grit that you might use for the RVK isn't going to supply you the correct RVK or the RPK for that cylinder wall. So what we'll do is we'll choose a grit that gives us the RVK that we desire, whether it whatever the application may be. And once that's finished and we have enough oil that we know that it's going to be in that cylinder wall, what we want to do now is because we've created the depth of that cut, we also have created a tremendous amount of, of coarseness in that cylinder wall. That RPK that we talked about before that we didn't want that would wear out the rings. We have to get rid of that some way. So what we're going to do in this multi-stage honing process is we're going to come back with a different grit stone and we're going to dress basically the cylinder wall itself. Now years ago, you would hear people talk about the cylinder walls having, the rings having to break into the cylinder wall. And it would use a quart, maybe two quarts of oil in the first 3,000 miles, whatever the engine manufacturer told you. We're able to eliminate that wear-in procedure and that, that the, as the rings seat to a substantial amount. The way that we're able to decrease that, that break-in time that you see is through this multi-stage honing process. Now what we'll do to get the proper RPK that we're looking for is come back with a different stone and do what we call plateau honing. Now plateau honing just means that. It's an actual plateau where it breaks off the fragmentation of the RPK and it decreases the distance between the RVK or the depth of that cut to the peak of that cut. And it removes that coarseness that we didn't want that would cause the rings to uh, not live the life that we're actually looking for. Now keeping with the same thing about plateau finishing, this is the last operation that you do. This is the icing on the cake, so to speak, right? So this is extremely critical. You don't want to mess it up. So we want to make sure that we get the proper finish and this is the last part of the operation for the cylinder hones that they'll see. Now, one thing that we didn't like we saw from some of the other machines and some of the other manufacturers were that the stones, instead of feeding out to the wall itself, they would spin and then feed out. The Rottler machine doesn't do that. Here you can see that we have a plateau mode, right, once we click on this button. So the strategy in which that the stones reach the cylinder wall is completely different than that of which when they were honing the cylinder wall. Now this is important because if it spins as it feeds out, it can actually change the finish at the top of the bore or wherever the hone head is when it actually touches off. What a day, what a day, what a day. But yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.